Okay, going to wind up talking about some um, uh, problem bacteria that we haven't otherwise uh, discussed. One of these is actinomycosis. All right, and um, actinomyces is an anaerobic gram-positive filamentous rod. Uh, phylogenetically supposedly it, it's, it's somewhat uh, of a higher bacteria kind of somewhere between bacteria and fungus uh, pretty hard to grow on culture and sensitivity and you do if you do uh, want to grow it you have to use anaerobic uh, transport culturettes and media okay often it's found in multi-organism infections uh, but is prone to form abscesses with uh, draining tracts and you can see uh, photos over here on the right these abscesses often have what are called sulfur granules uh, obviously they're not real sulfur uh, they're macro colonies of actinomycosis or actinomyces and if you uh, crush one of these on a slide and gram stain it then you see uh, the ground positive filamentous rods shown in the photo there. Uh, again, um, draining tracts, abscessation, fibrosis, uh, pretty nasty diseases. The, uh, the problem with actino, if you wind up treating it, uh, one, it takes a little while to get the culture back, so you kind of need a combination of clinical signs, sometimes histopath, and uh, you have to wait on the culture sometimes. The organism is pretty reliably susceptible uh, even to penicillin, which is probably the drug of choice. We'd probably go with oral amoxicillin, although you see these alternate choices that you can use. But the key thing here with actinomycosis is you have to uh, at least start off with pretty aggressive dosing and you have to go a long term time and here we're talking about months. It's not uncommon to have to treat for like six months um, uh, with amoxicillin trying to um, uh, cure um, actinomycosis. Uh, and that's kind of why we have all these other things, particularly the ones uh, listed below that have good activity in abscesses. Uh, and that's why isoniazid and rifampin have been tried, doxycycline, Chloramphenicol, your duration of therapy is going to be a little bit problematic, but all these. But typically, uh, the penicillins are, are your drug of choice, uh, and dog and cat oral amoxicillin, but fairly high doses and for a prolonged period of time. Now, I mentioned the enterococci on multiple occasions as we've gone through here. Again, they're what are called group D streptococci. Uh, which makes them a little different than regular streptococci. First off, they're normal flora of the GI tract, uh, and they tend to be relatively opportunistic, not highly pathogenic, at least not in the GI tract, and even in some wounds, not necessarily. But if you get uh, surgical sites, infected UTIs, catheters, endocarditis, all of these things, uh, they can play uh, definite roles. Uh, two major types, fecalis is the more common, at least in humans, but fecium is the more resistant. Now I've kind of alluded as we've gone along to agents uh, reliably effective against the intercoxi. That's not to say that some won't be unusually susceptible to penicillin. Certainly you test it and if it uh, is susceptible, fine, go with it. Uh, penicillin will be just great, especially uh, a fecalis may be susceptible. But it's not uncommon for either one of these to be resistant, and that's where uh, we get into the choices we've talked to before. Um, historically, a penicillin and aminoglycoside through its synergy is oftentimes effective. Uh, we don't do that as much anymore because we're trying to avoid the aminoglycoside risk. Uh, but it certainly is an option. In veterinary medicine, chloramphenicol is probably what we go with most of the time when we have a multi-drug resistant enterococci. Uh, again, watch for bone marrow suppression, and, and that of course can occur in any species. 
man and pr other primates have the aplastic anemia, but any species can get the dose dependent of bone marrow suppression. And sometimes we have an intercoccus fecalis that is resistant to other things but still sensitive to the carbapenem. So that's kind of a little niche uh, use there. Okay. Uh, now, the two I've mentioned that I want to reiterate are our last resort sorts of scenarios are vancomycin and lenizolid. Uh, vancomycin for years has been the drug of last resort for humans with multidrug resistant uh, intercoxi and for that matter multidrug resistant staph infections. Okay, uh, it has to be given uh, as an infusion over about an hour. So that tends to limit it to hospitalized situations having to do that uh, three to four times a day. Therein lies your problem. Yes, it can be somewhat nephrotoxic, um, not so much ototoxic anymore. That was in some early uh, cases with some imp impurities. But it's really the hospitalization that is our uh, uh, biggest problem in terms of using vancomycin. Okay. Now, in human medicine, they're now seeing vancomycin-resistant enterococci and vancomycin-resistant staphylococci. So what it, uh, have they done? Well, they've come up with linizolid, and there are a couple of others related to it that I haven't gone into. Uh, but linizolid is effective against uh, even the vancomycin-resistant uh, gram-positives. And because it can go orally, it, there is an injectable, but it can go orally more commonly in veterinary medicine, this is what we go to. So when nothing else will work on a staph or an intercoccus, uh, oftentimes we'll go toward linizolid. Our biggest problem is money. Now recently uh, the cost of that has come down. It's available generically, but it's still not inexpensive. Again. I would caution you against routine use of linizolid. This definitely should be a last resort where nothing else uh, is likely to work at all.